All right, good evening. We are glad everyone is here with us tonight. There we go. There's the bell. So we're, uh, we have a few more coming in. Uh, if you are coming in, you would like a sheet. There are some sheets in the back. And so please help yourself to the notes. Tonight we're going to be talking about unforgiveness, anger, and vengeance. And I know some people don't think, Mike, I look up the word unforgiveness and like, I've never heard that word or at least used it very often. Uh, we well, normally just say someone that's not willing to forgive. But tonight, I want us to look at these three words and especially their connection together because I think they're turning me down a little bit. Uh, because the unforgiveness, anger, and vengeance uh, have a strong connection together. Now, later on in the lesson tonight, we will talk about anger uh, in a separate way, but we're focusing on unforgiveness, anger, and vengeance. And so as we get started with tonight, let's go ahead and define some of our terms. So unforgiveness, um, as uh, I did from internet search, says when you are unwilling or unable to forgive someone, to forgive someone for hurting, betraying, breaking your trust, or causing you intense emotional pain, and really causing you just intense pain. This is this idea of someone that is unwilling or unable to forgive. Now, you might think, well, when, what situations would come up in life where I would be unwilling or unable to forgive? And at first, you might say, well, that would never happen. You know, maybe you've been raised in the church and you've been taught about forgiveness your entire life. But if we're honest with ourselves, there have been moments in our life when forgiveness was at least difficult. It wasn't easy. It wasn't easy maybe because of the what happened to us or what happened to someone we loved. And at the moment, we would fall in that category. We were unwilling to forgive, maybe even unable to forgive. And depending on what happened to you, that unable category might really come into play. Because there are some people in life that they have had something done to them that was so destructive, that was so evil, that their mind was consumed by whatever tragedy that came their way. And forgiveness for them was nearly, nearly impossible. So this idea of unforgiveness, unwilling or unable to forget or to forgive someone for hurting, betraying, breaking your trust or causing you intense emotional pain or just causing you intense pain. And we think about this connection tonight with these three topics and especially how they're tied together because we continue our study of the heart. And when unforgiveness and anger and vengeance especially latch on to us and take hold, it's going to have its toll on our physical bodies as well as our spiritual body. It's going to take its toll on us. And so we're going to look at some of this tonight. Some of those scenarios that it might be difficult to forgive would be things like murder. If a, lo- if a loved one is murdered or violently taken from us, I'm sure we would struggle, at least at first, with forgiveness. And if you don't, then you're, sh- you're stronger than, than a lot of people. Because a lot of people, when faced with something as terrible as murder, Forgiveness is very tough at first. And a lot of people have to pray and study, and it takes time for them to go through this process. And that's a key, that's a big word in this to truly come to terms and truly be able to forgive. Abuse. Just like murder, it's one of the horrible things that exist in our world. And I'm talking about anything from. Uh, you know, just physical abuse and harm to sexual abuse uh, to verbal abuse, whatever kind of abuse you're talking about here. 
It's all terrible in its, in its own way. And if it has happened to you, I'm sure the scenario and the, I'm sure the situation uh, was hard. Mentally, physically, emotionally, and, and spiritually. It was hard in every way. I'm sure that dealing with the topic of forgiveness in connection with a topic like abuse is difficult. But here we are, as Christians, in a world that's difficult. In a world where we live around sin and around evil. And we have to still live here. And we have to push through and we have to endure. We pray for people that have to go through situations like murder and abuse because they're facing something that probably most of us will never have to face. Forgiveness in this situation is is tough, but it's not impossible. Lying. You know, some people say, "Well, well, well, kids lie, and kids do lie. But lying hurts. It hurts when my children did it to me the first time. Uh, it hurts when it's, been, it's happened to me from friends, from family members. And I know it's hurt when I've done it to them. Lying hurts. And forgiving is not easy. And moving past that is not always something that happens immediately, even though it should, but it doesn't always. And we have to come to terms with that. Stealing or being cheated Someone taking our property, taking our possessions, taking the possessions of someone we love. It's, it's difficult to, to, to deal with that, especially if it's something that we really cared about. You know, someone asked me one time, you know, if, if it was a fire, what's the one thing that I would want to, to keep? Well, there's a little box, or there used to be a box, um, in my house. It had just a few flash drives on it. You might think, well, why do you want those flash drives? Those flash drives, I've backed up every picture that my wife and I have ever taken of our kids. And right underneath that was a copy of our, our marriage license. And, uh, and, you know, I really want that box. If someone broke into my house and took that one little box that has my pictures in it and a copy of our marriage license, that's really all that's in there. They're not getting anything valuable to them, but they're taking something very valuable away from me. I'd be very upset if they took that particular box. Being cheated. Being cheated out of something especially you thought you deserved, thought you earned, you worked hard, you put in the time and the effort, and this was yours to have, but you've been cheated out of that opportunity. And sometimes those feelings of being having something taken from you or being cheated, you feel like it's just hard to forgive. Adultery. Adultery is something that has plagued so many marriages. Uh, in our world. And it's something that as you listen to people that have had to go through this kind of situation, they lose that ability to trust. They lose that ability to, to, to know, you know, what's r- real anymore. And it takes them time, it takes them effort to put it in, to finally get their life back onto some s- semblance of on track. Forgiveness is part of all that process, and it takes a lot of energy. Divorce. Maybe your divorce, uh, you know, wasn't for the scriptural reasons like we see for, uh, for adultery. Divorce is horrible on the entire family, on everybody involved, on everybody that even knows that individual that couple, it's, it's difficult. And that kind of pain of being cheated, left, walked out on, etc. It, it's hard to endure. It causes great physical, emotional, spiritual, causes all kinds of pain. Now from this unforgiveness, from these moments in time where, they, where we are just being tested, where everything about us and everything about who we're supposed to be as Christians is being put to the test, and and now we're supposed to respond. Some people find anger. Their response to this unfortunate circumstances that have befallen them, they turn to anger. And what anger is, as we define it, is a strong feeling of annoyance, 
displeasure or hostility. Now, I really think that's kind of a, a weak definition of anger, but anger, it builds and it grows like a fire. And the more we feed it and the more we you know, give into it, the stronger it gets. It takes away our clear thoughts. It takes away our, our intentions. Anger consumes us. Now that's that evil, you know, destructive kind of anger that we all know about. But before we go any farther, I want to say this. There is good anger. There's anger that is appropriate, and there is anger that is, that is needed. When we look in John chapter 2, verses 13 through 17, you're going to see Jesus. He's going to be very upset. I'm going to say angry. Here he is, the son of God. He is God. There before the temple. And it says this, Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. When he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured up out the money changers' money and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Then his disciples remembered what it was written, zeal for your house has eaten me up. Here was some people that were taking the temple of God and using it as a place of merchandise, of trade, and really of evil practices. They were taking something that was supposed to be pure and holy and set apart for God and they were dishonoring it. Now here you see Jesus and he's very serious about what he does. He makes for himself this, this whip. He drives them out of this place. He turns over their tables and if anybody was to see a picture of this and, or a movie of this and not understand what's going on and who he is, they might think well, he's just enraged. That he is just this crazy person and he's lost his mind. And how dare he come in there and turn over their tables? It was his house. his father that they were disown dishonoring and here he is and yes he showed a very zealous approach and it says that it has eaten him up but yet when we read about Jesus even though all of the accounts of Jesus are known by God by the Holy Spirit you see that in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and verse 21, and in Hebrews chapter 4, and verse 15, that Jesus, that he knew no sin. It says, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Hebrews 4, 15, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was at all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. A lot of people, when talking about anger, want to come to this passage and say, look, see, Jesus was angry and he lost control. I would say, here's God. And if anything, he was in total control in his own house. And so you see, here he was, and what was he angry at? He was angry at sin. He was angry at dishonoring his father, dishonoring his father's house, of taking something that was holy and precious and destroying it. He drove them out, and there was no sin found in him. But going back to that evil, wicked kind of anger that 
really just drives and feeds on our unwillingness to forgive. That anger builds up, as we said, and it grows, and it leads to something that we would call vengeance. And vengeance is where we enact a punishment. It says a punishment is inflicted or retribution exacted for an injury or a wrong. That we are going to take it on our own hands and we are going to make sure that the guilty party pays. That we're going to take it out of their flesh. That we're going to take it out of their money. That we're going to take it out of whatever we can because we have been wronged and therefore we're going to take it ourselves. Now we have a legal system in our country. And we're not going to talk about the fairness of the legal system or anything about it. It's still a legal system. And the legal system has laws, has rules. And there are certain things that we can and cannot do. We have the ability in our country to, uh, to, to call the police and have them come and respond and to hopefully arrest the guilty party. We have the ability to, to have our own possessions and to have those deeds to our houses and the title to our cars, and no one is able, should not be able to take those from us. And we are supposed to be able to go before a court of our, uh, and a jury of our peers and, and be judged in a fair way. Not telling you that happens all the time. But that is what's supposed to happen within our country. Vengeance is not ours to repay. In fact, as Christians, we need to look to a higher standard when it comes to taking out vengeance. Before we get to that, though, let's talk about some examples. Examples of unforgiveness, anger, and vengeance. And the first two we're going to talk about don't, don't fit maybe the way you would think they would. First, we're going to talk about Cain and Abel. This is in Genesis chapter 4, uh, verses 1 through 12. You might be thinking, Cain and Abel, well, why was, Cain wasn't, you know, he wasn't really unforgiving, or, or was he? Let's, let's, look, read the, let's read this account together. It says in Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 12, Now Adam knew, his, knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, and said, Have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, and this time Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. In the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. And its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Now Cain talked with his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against, his, against Abel, his brother, and killed him. And the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother? And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield, no longer yield its strength to you. A fugitive and a vagabond, you shall be on the earth. And still you might be thinking, okay, well, what does this have to do with unforgiveness? See, here's the thing. Jealousy is what we see here. We see a brother that is jealous. A brother that has offered a sacrifice. And as we can see through the context, the sacrifice was not appropriate to God. But let's ask ourselves something. In every situation when we were unwilling to forgive, was the person that we were holding that grudge against always guilty? Were they always at wrong? Had they always done something to actually offend us? Or is it possible and probable that in some of the instances in which we held a grudge and were unwilling to forgive, they were the innocent party? And they had done nothing to deserve our anger and our vengeance. I don't know about for you, but for me, I'm ashamed to say that oftentimes 
that's the absolute case. Is that we have misread a situation and now we're angry at them for something that they didn't do. It wasn't their fault. They were completely and totally innocent from this. They actually did something right, as in the case of Abel. But yet we were going to pick someone to blame. And instead of Cain turning and blaming God, God, how dare you accept my sacri- or his sacrifice over mine? He took it out on his brother Abel. He didn't just talk to him. He convinced him. He didn't just kill him. He slaughtered him. This was his anger. And yes, we might say well, the motivation here was jealousy. He wanted to put the blame off on somebody else, and he was jealous, and he took it out on his brother. A similar situation, like I said, these don't perfectly fit into unforgiveness, but they're, they're very similar. It's found over in Genesis chapter um, 37. In Genesis ch- chapter 37, you have Joseph and his brothers. And we'll kind of just kind of uh, uh, kind of give an overview of this chapter, but basically, Joseph keeps having all these wonderful dreams. At least to him, they're wonderful. And he keeps, you know, celebrating these in front of his brother and his father and saying, you know, y'all are going to bow down to me. Y'all are going to bow down and worship me. And the, the different dreams he has, you know, just give this clear demonstration that the younger and even the father are going to bow down to Joseph. The father doesn't really like it, but he kind of just pushes it to the side and he's thinking on it a little bit. He's just not, not really paying as much of attention as the brothers are. But the brothers, they remember. And the brothers, they let it consume them. And while they are out tending to the flocks, they see Joseph coming from a distance. And they plot in their hearts what they're going to do to him. And they take that young man, Joseph, and they rip off his garment. They... Some of them wanted to kill him. Reuben's able to keep that from happening. They throw him into a pit. Reuben had good intentions. He was going to come back and get his brother. But by the time he gets back to him, they haven't killed him, but they have sold him. They then just say, you know, we got to keep the deception going, so we're going to take that coat. We're going to kind of mess it up a little bit. We're going to make sure it's covered in blood and let our father jump to the conclusions that he is going to jump to because they knew what he was going to think. And that's exactly what he thought. He, they thought. he thought some wild animal had gotten after his son. Now here in this situation, once again, just like Cain and Abel, jealousy. I mean, he was the favorite son. He did get the coat of many colors. But you see within this elements that, that lead to, you know, they weren't able to forget the fact that he was the favorite. And that he was maybe... Maybe he was a little arrogant, a little proud, and a little boastful. Maybe he was a little too young and immature, and they couldn't get over his attitude or his demeanor in front of them. How dare he say they're going to bow down and worship him? It consumed them. They couldn't get over it. Their jealousy, and I think even a little bit of unforgiveness, led to their anger and their vengeance. And while they didn't kill him, they basically led him to what could have been his death. Now, other scenarios like Genesis chapter 34 with Dinah and the sons of Jacob. I mean, Dinah, Dinah is here and she is the innocent party. She is the one that is abused. She is the one that is violated. uh, And here she is. And it seems like at first no one's taking up for her. That her father's not happy, he's not pleased, but he's not really acting in maybe the ways that the brothers wanted him to. And so the brothers have a plan. I think especially Simeon and Levi have a plan. That the marriage contract is being negotiated between Dinah and the culprit. The man that has come after her. And in this relationship here... Simeon and Levi and the, uh, the brothers have a plan. We're going to strike them at their weakest. So we're going to have them make a deal with us to be circumcised. And when they were in extreme and great pain, 
from the circumcision because they don't have modern medicine today. They took this moment of weakness and they enacted their revenge. They didn't just kill them, they plundered them. All the men. They plundered the whole place. They killed them all. Unwilling to forgive, anger and vengeance. And some of you might say, well, they had it coming. Here these men took something in their own hands and, and did something that was just gruesome. But think about David and Bathsheba, and you think about David and Bathsheba, what does that have to do with unforgiveness and anger? You say Uriah died. Who, who else was there to forgive? The husband that had been betrayed, the husband that had been, you know, you know, led into battle and led to his death, he wasn't there anymore. So who are we talking about in unforgiveness and anger and vengeance? Right, you're talking about David. Because when you look here in the story, the story doesn't stop with David's sin. The story actually continues with David's repentance. And in 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verses 1 through 15, you're going to see the prophet Nathan talking to David about a, a scenario, a story that he, that he has heard. It says, And the Lord said to Nathan, or said Nathan to David, and he came to him and said to him, There were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he had, had bought and nourished, and it grew up together with him and with his children. It ate at his own food and drank from his own cup and lay in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. And a traveler came to the rich man who refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd to prepare one for the wayfaring man who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. So David's anger was greatly aroused against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die. And he shall restore fourfold for the lamb because he did this thing because he had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, you are the man. Here is, as it goes on in the next few verses, the anointed king of God who is guilty of adultery, of lying, of murder. And here another scenario comes up where a man has taken the only lamb of a poor man to feed a stranger that came to his house. David is furious, he's filled with anger. He doesn't go to the man and say, hey, restore the sheep, restore the lamb. He wants, him, he wants his head. He's actually going after him. Restore this fourfold. He is so, you can, just, you can just hear it in the language here. He is greatly upset. And then Nathan turns it on him and says, David, you are the man. Sometimes we think about forgiveness. We're unwilling to forgive others and we forget to look at ourselves. When you think about unforgiveness, though, you can't not talk about the unforgiving servant from Matthew 18. In fact, we could have spent our entire class just in Matthew 18. Uh, we didn't do that, but uh, Matthew 18, looking at verses 23 through 34. It says, Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was, <clears throat> one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents, but he was not able to pay his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him saying, Master, have patience with me and I will pay you all. Then the master of the servant was moved with compassion, released him and forgave him the debt. But the servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat saying, pay me what you owe me. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him saying have patience with me and I will pay you all and he would not but went and threw him into prison so he should pay the debt so when his fellow servants saw the, what had been done they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done 
Then his master, after he called him, said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all the debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. And, and this, we're not really talking about the master, even though I guess you could include him. We're talking about this servant that was unwilling to show the forgiveness that had been shown to him to a fellow servant, to someone that owed him 100 denarii, 100 days wages. He couldn't show forgiveness and compassion. Same is true of the prodigal son's brother, <laughs> of the other brother uh, from Luke chapter 15. There in verse 28, you see him, he's just pouting. He's just upset. He, he, he doesn't want to join the party. He can't believe they killed the fatted calf. He can't believe that they've welcomed him home. You know, he took his money and he ran and had a good time with it. And the brother is not happy. He's upset. Maybe it's because of unforgiveness. You definitely see it's because of anger. Don't really see vengeance, but I don't think he really cared too much at this moment for what was going on. Now, the father does come to him in this story, but you listen to these accounts, these stories we've gone through tonight, and you hear a lot of people that are either not willing to forgive something that might have happened to them or that might have been someone else's fault. They're not willing to forgive somebody that's done somebody terrible. They're not willing to forgive somebody even though they themselves have been forgiven over and over again. They're not willing to forgive somebody that's even their flesh and blood that has come home and is no longer in harm's way. Those categories match up with a lot of us sometimes. We find ourselves unwilling to forgive and angry and maybe even full of vengeance in our heart that we want our pound of flesh and we want it now. But we as Christians, we need to overcome unforgiveness and anger and vengeance. We need to first, we need to learn about true forgiveness and we'll go into this a little bit more next week. We need to learn what it means to truly forgive. And yes, we know we talk about some horrible situations that have happened to other people and maybe have even happened to us. But no matter how difficult the situation was and how hard it is, we need to begin this process right now of forgiving. That doesn't make it easy, but it needs to be something that we've done and that we do. I want you to think about John chapter 8. John chapter 8, verses 1 through 12. Here is a woman that has been caught in adultery. And it says, But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now early in the morning he came again to the temple, and all the people came to him. And he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. We're going to stop right here. Here, these men that are wanting to trick Jesus, that is their intention. They're wanting to set a trap for him. They're wanting him to make a mistake. Here they are. And they have brought before Jesus a woman that was guilty of adultery. In a marriage, there's not much we can say that would lessen this sin because it's awful, it's terrible. One thing I would say about this though is, where's the man? Says they caught her in the very act. Here they brought this woman before them. I'm just kind of curious where the man's at. Here they are, and everything about Jesus that they dislike, they're, gonna, they're just trying. They're trying to get one over on him. 
And they take this woman who, yes, is guilty of sin. They're going to use her as a pawn. As someone that is going to help get them through, accomplish what they mean to. They're not even thorough in this by bringing the man to, at least not from what we can tell. But here they are, and they're sitting here before Jesus, and at first he's just kind of almost ignoring them. He's, he's riding in the sand. He then, when he does acknowledge them, he looks at them, and he, he, or he's going to say something here in a moment that uh, maybe we need to say to ourselves. It says this in verse 6, it says, They said this testing him, that we, they have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger, as though he did not hear. So they continued asking him. He raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And he good, again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And those who heard it began being convicted in their conscience went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone. And the one, woman standing in the midst, when Jesus raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, no, one Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Here is Jesus in front of a sinner, an adulterer, someone who has definitely violated the law of the Lord. And their law said for her to be stoned, for her to be put to death. And yet Jesus says here, you who have not sinned, cast the first stone. All of us have sinned. We know it. Every single one of us have sinned before before God, before each other, before our friends and before our family. Jesus teaches a lesson here about forgiveness that we all need to remember. Our friends, our family, the people next to us in the pews, the people out in the world, we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. Almost 3.23. We sin. We needed forgiveness before we even recognized we were sinning. And even now that we've been cleansed by the, by the, by the blood of Jesus Christ, sometimes we're still going to sin. And we're going to need to repent. And we're going to need to confess. And we're going to need to come back. Jesus taught a great lesson about forgiveness. Some of you may be thinking, well, okay, well, how many times are we supposed to forgive? I know that, that many of his followers thought, thought the same thing. They asked that very question in Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 and 22. It says, then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Now, here's the thing. None of us are expected to walk around with a notepad saying, okay, 490 times. Is that right? Did I do my math correct? Okay, 490 times. Up, oh, Mr. Gary's at 491. He's off my list. It's not what Jesus is teaching here. He is using this as a great illustration to know, for one thing, no one's going to sit around and mark up to 490 times. But this was far greater than, than their day. This was far greater, even seven was greater than, than what other leaders were telling you had to forgive. So seven times? 
That was more than plenty, right? No, Jesus said 70 times 7. He wanted a year of forgiveness to be complete, complete whole, to be thorough through and through. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verses 7 through 11, we see there a list of very, you know, dark sins. And it has a saying in there that says, and such were some of you. As Christians, we need to remember that, that such were some of us in our life before we put on Christ. Well, thinking about forgiveness, we need to think about passages like Matthew 5 and verses 23 to 26, where it says, Therefore, if you bring your gift to an altar and there, and there remember your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come off of your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you're on your way, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge and the judge hand you over to the officer and you be thrown into prison. Surely I say to you, you will by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny. When you think about that in connection with our forgiveness, when you think about the restoration that we're supposed to be seeking with fellow Christians that do fall short, Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1, that we are to be the ones that are restoring them. We need to think about passages like Matthew chapter 8, 18 and verses 15 through 17 where it says, Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go tell him his fault between you you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear you, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses to even hear the church, let him to you, or let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. We have brothers and sisters in Christ that may have wronged us, that may have fallen away, that we have not yet gone to, that we have not helped restore. If we're going to talk about unforgiveness and anger and vengeance, these are the kind of attitudes and these are the kind of things that we need to be putting into practice into our life. We need to seek after ways in which that we can pray for one another in James chapter 5, verse 16. We confess our faults one to another and pray for one another. Why? Because prayer works. And we want to pray for other people. The prayer of a righteous man availeth much. We need to recognize the forgiveness that God God has given us. 1 John 1 and verse 9. The ability we have to go to God to be forgiven is something we do not need to take for granted. But it's something that we need to share that ability with the world. We need to learn to control our anger and the chapter 5, verse 21 and 22, it gives warning about even being angry with your brother. Being angry with anyone. In fact, in our anger, it says we are to be angry and sin not, and but to give no place for the devil. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 26 and 27. James chapter 1, verses 19, 19 through 20, tells us, you know, that we need to be, we need to slow down a little bit. We need to listen. We need to be slow to that anger it builds up within us. Think about Joshua chapter 20 and verses 1 through 9 in connection with vengeance. These cities of refuge were set up as a safeguard to keep someone that had committed an accidental murder, an accidental killing, from having vengeance taken out upon him until a fair trial could be had. It was present in their day and time, and it's still present today. Unforgiveness, anger, and vengeance. But for us, we see in Romans chapter 12, verse 17 and 19, that we're not to repay evil for evil. We're actually to seek after living peaceably with all men. Then in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 15, we see how we are to pursue that which is good. But here's the thing that we need to understand. In Romans chapter 12 and verses 20 through 21, it reads this. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. 
Do not become, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This passage is taken in the same context where you go back up to chapter 12 and verse 7 through 19, where it says there, there in that verse 19, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. When we think about unforgiveness and anger and vengeance, we need to think about how, we be, how we've been forgiven and how we would want to be forgiven and use that forgiveness that God has given to us to go into the world and as we go, be a forgiving people, to not be overcome by anger, to not lead our anger, lead us to wrath and to vengeance, but to live and to love as God has loved us. Thank you all.